This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. There was one big change. I, I will give 50 this. There, the one big change for me was all of a sudden, my breakfast cereal became deadly serious. <laughs> like, I, like, overnight. I remember recently my breakfast cereal was fun, the boxes were bright, and there were words like sugar and pow and crisp. <laughs> you turn the box over, and there was a word find or a maze. A maze. Help Sugar Bat get to his insulin. And now, <laughs> all of... All of my breakfast cereal, first off, the box is white. <laughs> Hospital white <laughs> and there's a beige bowl a color of beige I like to call bargaining beige <laughs> like how many bowls of this do I have to eat so I can have one cool ranch Dorito at 3 o'clock today <laughs> how many? that many Ugh. that was a clip from the new Netflix comedy special Patton Oswalt I Love Everything out on May 19th the Emmy and Grammy-winning comedian reflects on hilarious existential anecdotes after recently embracing his 50s, which include a lot of hiking and eating ancient grains, passing up the chance to board a full-scale Millennium Falcon so he could attend his daughter's second-grade art show, and how buying a house is like hiring a suicide squad of superhuman subcontractors. And today, I'm thrilled to finally welcome Patton Oswalt to the show, as he recalls coming up as a comedian at the dawn of the alt-comedy scene, his first gig in Hollywood as a writer for Mad TV, and his prolific side gig as a script doctor on some of the biggest box office hits of the past two decades. He reminisces about his self-proclaimed addiction to movies, his touching friendship with the owner of L.A.'s most famous revival cinema, and his love of the films of Billy Wilder and Sidney Lumet. Then we talk about turning 50, finding love again after the death of his first wife, and turning his late wife's book about the Golden State Killer into a docu-series for HBO. Plus, what it was like going to college in that wild party town of Colonial Williamsburg, the time he donated to one of his Twitter trolls' crowdfunding campaign, and how he got Netflix to build him a house for his new special. Coming up with comedian Patton Oswalt in just a moment. My guest today is stand-up comedian, actor, voice actor, and writer, Pat Oswalt. You know him from TV shows like The King of Queens, Mystery Science Theater 3000, and The Goldbergs, and movies like Ratatouille, Magnolia, and Big Fan, as well as nine comedy specials, including a new hour-long comedy special, Pat Oswalt, I Love Everything, which streams on Netflix beginning May 19th. Pat Oswalt, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, in, any time. Now, how is the quarantine treating you? I mean, you've got a, a young daughter to entertain, so that's got to be a whole other thing. Um, well, I mean, luckily, um, her school and some of the parents have set up a really good, like, homeschooling schedule and, you know, activities, and we're doing, like, scheduled um, FaceTime play dates, I guess, and yeah. trying to go for walks and everything. And But, yeah, it's trying to keep things as normal as possible. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, I was just telling actually the the publicist from Netflix while we were talking uh, before you came on here that the other day my wife and I went on a walk in the neighborhood and I saw kids playing in the front yard and then one of the kids' friends and that kid's mom sitting on a blanket on top of their car on the street talking to them. <laughs> it was the <laughs> looked like the the worst possible play date imaginable, but <laughs> Oh my God! That's, well, you do uh, what you gotta do. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's that sounds kind of. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's gonna be one of those things that like we look back on and go, oh wow, that's uh, 
God, that's weird. Yeah. I keep thinking about that. I can't imagine what a movie about this era down the line 50 years from now would look like. Are kids going to look at this and say, wow, that was really weird. People weren't shaking hands and hanging out. Or will they be amazed that there was a time when we went to movie theaters and when we went to packed restaurants and stuff like that? I'm curious how they'll play out. Yeah. Are we going to watch, are we going to watch like footage of like outdoor concerts and music festivals and either shudder or are we going to feel wistful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. And of course I know you're a big movie buff. I mean, what the hell's going to happen to theaters? You know, it's just all these movie theaters were probably already struggling before coronavirus hit. And now who knows if they'll yeah. even exist, especially, you know, the mom and pop art houses and those places. You know, what, what are we going to watch a 70 millimeter epic like Lawrence of Arabia on a 60 inch television screen? Yeah, I honestly, I don't know. I just don't know. It's rough, <laughs> but we'll yeah. get through it, I guess. I was interested to read about you. Uh, I guess you grew up in Northern Virginia. You were a military brat. And I saw that you went to William and Mary for college. And I've always wanted to ask someone who went to William and Mary what it's like to go there. I mean, Colonial Williamsburg has to be the strangest possible college town. <laughs> what, what is a wild yeah, well, night like there? It was a little, I mean, we, look, we were college students. We managed to find a way to, to get wasted and yeah. uh, be silly. But um, there was that, you know, there were like the locals that would dress up like colonial figures and walk around and then you'd kind of see them getting ready to go out. Um, like, you know, Ben Franklin with the Walkman on. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, we were, a lot of us were like, so, um, uh, you know, deep into our own thing with yeah. college that, you know, it wasn't that bad. And and plus they were like, you could get drunk at an old tavern and pretend like you were part of the revolution. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just like going apple bobbing or, you know, pushing a barrel hoop with a stick or something for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, now, when did you first get bit by the comedy bug, Patton? Uh, right between um, freshman and sophomore year of college, that kind of summer when you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I better figure out something. So I just started doing a bunch of different um, jobs. And one of them was uh, I started doing oat mics. And that one just really clicked. Mm-hmm. You know, that really, really clicked for me. Yeah, I saw that you got your first time on stage at Garvin's in D.C. That, that's where I think Chappelle got started too, right? Yeah, we started the same night. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, he was 14 years old. Wow. He was 14. How old were you? You you said you were in college, 19. I guess. <laughs> I was 19. Yeah. yeah. I was 19. He was 14. He, um, uh, he went on stage and it, it, he just felt like he'd been doing it for 30 years. He was so immediately amazing. Really? Like, oh, this guy. It's one of those things where like, oh, I'm at the dawn of a massive, uh, an amazing artist right now. I'm watching the, the debut of it. How about your own set? How was that? I had a ways to go. Okay. (laughs) All right. (laughs) And I hate to ask this question because I know that people always get asked it, but who were the comedians that you looked up to when you were coming up in the business or, or before that, when you were a young kid? Yeah. Before, you know, before I started doing comedy, it was obviously like George Carlin, Bill Cosby and Steve Martin and Richard Pryor. And then once I started doing comedy, it was just all of my friends. Yeah. It went right to like, uh, it's all of my friends. Yeah. You say something interesting that I read. Uh, I guess you, you don't trust comedians who don't hang out with other comedians. You're a big fan of the hang. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was like the main reason that you wanted to become a comedian was to get to hang out, um, you know, with other creative people and, you know, hear jokes getting done and, um, you know, being at the dawn of all that, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want to be there? Mm -hmm. You know? And I also heard you say, I think on a podcast that you were a big fan of Henny Youngman. Me too. When I listened to that guy, especially his albums, which were recorded, you know, when he was no spring chicken, I'm just amazed at the mental agility and his ability to recall all those jokes in such rapid succession like that. Yeah. I was listening to some, where was that? It was on the radio somewhere at, it was one of his albums and it's like, yeah, just that rapid fire, like, sometimes the jokes weren't that good, but it was the, it was the cumulative building up 
of it that really um, after a while that became what was funny and really just kind of blew you away. You know? Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was like a howitzer the way he would spit out those jokes. And, and he, sometimes it's like one joke didn't even have a chance to land before he was already on to the next one. Yeah, I know. I loved it. I just, yeah. I love the pacing. <laughs> Now you came up at an interesting time in comedy because the eighties comedy boom was starting to wane and you were just at the dawn of the alt comedy scene. Was that sort of a scary time to be a comic because, you know, mainstream comedy was in a slump and all these clubs were closing and here you guys were performing in bookstores and coffee houses and living rooms. And, you know, who knew then that there was even going to be any money in alt comedy or that alt comedy was even going to be able to sustain itself? Yeah, but I mean, for me, it was it was exciting because it was um, about uh, the fact that the people that were still doing it were the people that really wanted to do it no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, so to be able to be with again, it, it became a, new, a different version of the hang of, oh, we get to actually um, be with people that want to do this, even if they have to have a day job rather than people that were just like, ah, it's easy, whatever, just do these few hack jokes, who cares? So that kind of camaraderie and excitement, it didn't feel scary to me. It felt like, oh, these are the people who should be doing comedy and should be getting the attention. So it mm-hmm. felt great, you know? Yeah. And in your book, Silver Screen Fiend, I remember you talking about how that was when you realized sort of the difference between the comedians that you would see at somewhere like Garvin's, who were all just getting to get a comedy special versus the comedians who were true artists who were just doing it for the laugh and and oftentimes just to make each other laugh. Exactly. Yeah. There was a lot of that, you know, sometimes it got a little too insular, but Mm -hmm. the excitement of just doing something purely creative was still there and that sustained it, I think, and definitely sustained me. Yeah. And I like that you brought up the problem of comedy getting too insular sometimes, because I've heard you say that you felt most at home performing at the Largo here in LA, which was one of the first places where alt comics could get stage time at an actual club. And I think you still perform there a couple of times a month, even today. But earlier in your career, you say that you would catch yourself and other comedians getting a little too comfortable there, that it would almost become too much of a bubble what would kill with that specific audience wouldn't always play very well at mainstream clubs or on the road. At a certain point, did you just have to make a choice that you just didn't want to only be a Largo comic? Well, the Largo was a great place to write, but the road helped you edit and, you know, Ah. get things down to stuff that worked. So yeah, there was a lot of like, I didn't want to become like an alt comedy hothouse flower. I love the Largo. (laughs) I still do, but you have to then take your stuff out into the world Mm. and, you know, make that work um, and find your audience out there. So that, I think, I thought both of those forms of tension were important. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, you have to always expand the canvas. And around that same time, you wrote for Mad TV. That must have been a pretty early in the series, I guess, because I think it premiered in, what, 95 or 96? Yeah, I I wrote the pilot in the first two seasons. Was that a pretty good experience for you? Because I've talked to some writers who've said that it was great working on that show and others who say that at least in those first years, it felt like Mad TV was constantly in the shadow of SNL and it was always a struggle to get the network suits or the producers to approve a sketch that was edgy or too smart. What was it like for you, Patton? Yeah, it was it was it definitely taught me to, you know, uh, be uh, more thorough in my pitching and creating and don't don't just you know, just toss things off. I. I tended to be a deadly combination of sloppy and judgmental about other people's <laughs> work. So that really cured me, disabused me of those uh, notions. Yeah. So that was, you know, that was good. I've also heard at least one writer tell me that the producers at Mad TV were real sticklers for grammar and spelling. And I don't know why, but that kind of took me by surprise that a show like Mad TV would be so obsessive about something like that. I mean, it wasn't that they were sticklers for punctuation. It was that, if you didn't bother, you know, uh, spell checking and grammar checking your um, pitch, then is the pitch even all that good? Like, put huh. your best foot forward, you know? So it's kind of like, uh, you know, those musicians who go and put some weird writer into their contract because <laughs> they want to make sure that you're really paying attention and you're really putting all everything into the... No, I, going and, and I totally, one. look, I agree yeah. with that. And you've also had a a really prolific sideline as a Hollywood script doctor. You worked as an uncredited writer on 
God, everything from Monsters, Inc. to many of the Shrek movies to Borat and Shallow Hal. I never worked on Monsters, Inc. Oh, you I didn't? worked on um, oh, I you did. uh, a lot of the Fairly Brothers movies, a lot of the DreamWorks animation movies, mm -hmm. um, Tropic Thunder, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I just you know, come in and do a round table where you go through and, you know, work on the jokes and make the scenes tighter and stuff like that. Can a guy make a pretty good living punching up scripts? Yeah, I mean, there's people that that's, they, they make a great living doing that. They make a great living rewriting scripts and being scripted. I mean, Harold Ramos was a script doctor for years. Harold Ramos. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I think he did some uncredited work on The Mask and uh, that Rodney Dangerfield movie, Back to School. And it's funny because I was talking with a Broadway producer a while back, mm -hmm. and he was telling me that there's this dentist in Queens <laughs> who moonlights as a gag writer. And apparently he's really well known in theater circles as the go-to guy to punch up a play before it opens. Rest yeah. of the time he's just doing root canals and filling cavities. But I guess he's got quite a little side hustle as a script doctor. I guess you can do that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, it's fun though. It's good work if you can get it. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll return with more when we come back in just a moment. Now, I mentioned earlier that you're also a huge movie buff, and I absolutely loved your book, Silver Screen Fiend, in which you lovingly talk about your quote-unquote addiction to revival house movies back in the 90s, and in particular to the New Beverly Cinema, which is a place that I just love and have so much history with myself. It sounds like that place was sort of your film school, huh? Oh, yeah. It was definitely, you know, it was a lot of people's film school. They, a lot right. of people talk about how the New Beverly was like, you know, five bucks for two movies a night, you get to, you know, learn about movies, what works and what doesn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, Tarantino who now owns it said that it was a big influence on him as well. And other filmmakers too. Yes. Yeah. They were, um, he's the one that kept it going Yeah, good for him. Yeah. And I remember the owner Sherman Torgan, how he would always be there every night operating the ticket booth himself. I mean, talk yeah, about someone who just did something for the love of it. And yeah. was completely happy and zen in that one little world that he had created there. Uh, yeah, it was it was the best. It was you know people would you'd always see him in the booth, and he would remember everyone that came in after a while. And it was just it, I just I miss him. I mean, I'm glad yeah. the place is still open, and and they're really embracing the whole kind of rep movie theater thing. But yeah, everyone misses Sherman, you know. Well, I used to go there when I was in film school at USC in the mid-90s, probably the same time as you, actually. Who knows? You and I may have been sitting two rows apart, wishing that the other one would stop chomping on popcorn or something. Wow. But I would go there because Sherman often showed movies that I didn't see in film school. And I always wondered how he came up with some of those film pairings, because sometimes it would totally make sense, like two Howard Hawks movies or The Front Page and All the President's Men. But then other times, it would be like Rashomon and Duck Soup or something. And I'd be trying to figure out what's the common thread there. I know. But but the, but that was great, <laughs> yeah. though. I loved it, you know. And a lot of times, I remember he would pair a director or an actor's best film with one of his worst films, or at least one of his less commercially successful films. And a good example of that is the double feature that you saw the first time that you went to the New Beverly Sunset Boulevard and Ace in the Hole. Yeah. Now, Sunset Boulevard is probably on or near my top 10 list, but I confess that I've never actually seen Ace in the Hole. And I know that it bombed horribly at the box office when it originally came out. Ace is Ace in the Hole a pretty good movie? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a huge bomb when it came out, but it's aged very, very well. You know the Billy Wilder movie that yeah. hasn't aged well? I just realized this very recently. Sabrina. I've probably seen it at least half a dozen times, but then I watched it with my wife recently. And I don't know if this is a result of the Me Too era or what, but she's like, why the hell is this sad, desperate girl, Audrey Hepburn, throwing herself at this feckless playboy who doesn't even give her the time of day? Ow. And next thing you know, this bunch of rich assholes is trying to buy her off to get rid of her. And then yeah. they think, oh, they can just pawn her off on the old broken down brother, Humphrey Bogart, who had to be at least twice her age. And he's planning to ditch her and send her off to Paris alone. But then at the last minute, he suddenly has a change of heart and she just falls into his arms like nothing ever happened. <laughs> and my wife opened my eyes. Uh, this story is pretty messed up. I mean, that's not the kind of woman that you or I would ever want our daughters wow. to grow up to be, is it? 
I haven't seen that in a while. I'll have to check that out again. I, I, I remember seeing it at the new Beverly actually. Oh, really? I got to go see that again. A lot of his comedies, I, I went and saw kiss me stupid a few years ago, which I don't think was well regarded when it came out, but mm. man, that thing is not funny. Yeah. And I was trying to watch love in the afternoon and that one oh, also yeah. was just like, ah, maybe this yeah. is a different time. Yeah. 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 I totally get that. You know, and you've described that period of life as an addiction of sorts to classic films. You would go see a movie almost every night and even had this funny superstition, I guess, about not going to clubs yeah. and performing unless you had seen a movie that day. Well, that's what the whole book was about. Yeah. But I love this quote from your book. You say that at the drunkest, the worst that you would do is watch Murder on the Orient Express and fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I have terrible drug stories. And I'm assuming that you mean the Sidney Lumet version with Albert yes. Finney as Poirot and not the Peter Ustinov or Kenneth Branagh versions. Well, when I wrote the book, the new one wasn't yeah. out yet. Yeah, oh, the right. new one didn't exist. And what a cast. Lauren Bacall, Ingrid Bergman, Sean Connery, John Gielgud, Vanessa Redgrave, I think Michael movie. York. It's genuinely great movie. I can't think of a movie that had more star power since then. I mean, what a group of actors. And the score for that movie was just fantastic. Oh, I know. That's a great one. My family and I actually just yeah. recently took the Real Orient Express from Paris to Venice. And I had that theme music on repeat the whole time. And it's funny because it would seem like such an unlikely fit for a director like Sidney Lumet. Except Murder on the Orient Express has really dark stuff in it. True. That last scene, man, where they're stabbing mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Well, Patton, one thing I've learned from doing some 500 interviews like this is you just never know what you're going to find out under the trivia section in a person's IMDb profile. Now, I honestly don't know if this is true. It would seem a little out of place for such a film buff like you. And, and maybe you don't even know about this yourself. But IMDb claims that your favorite movie of all time is an obscure movie called Six Pack, which starred Kenny Rogers as a NASCAR driver who adopts a bunch of orphan boys. <laughs> I, I can't judge because I've never seen it, but it, it's kind of hard for me to believe that you would rank a Kenny Rogers movie up there with Sunset Boulevard and Casablanca and all the classics. Have you even seen this movie? I, I don't, I think someone added that to my, I, I haven't read my IMDb profile. I think someone added it as a joke. Oh. I, I don't know what that, I don't know what that movie is. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I was never wondering about that. I've never heard of that. I don't never heard of that movie yet, but I've also never read my IMDb profile. So I don't know. I Sorry. guess that's the downside of crowdsourcing information. I guess. <laughs> you have to be ever vigilant of your own profile. huh? I don't know what that movie is. Yeah, that seemed a little bit out of place. Plus, if you have to pick a Kenny Rogers movie, you have to go with The Gambler. Yeah. Now, is it true that you once made a girl that you were dating walk back to her car at 2 a.m. alone in Hollywood because you wanted to stay at an all night movie marathon? Yeah, that's in the. That's in the book. Yeah, that's in the book. Well, yeah, what were, what were the movies the that book. were so worth it that you, you sent her alone? I think I was doing some all-night horror movie marathon, and I was doing that weird thing where it's like I, ha I have to finish every movie that I sit down to watch. I can't, like, interrupt. It, it was just yeah. weird obsessive compulsiveness. But again, <laughs> it's all detailed in the book. I was also surprised to learn that when you first came to L.A., your ultimate goal was to become a director. Do you still want to eventually get around to that? And are there some projects that you might be kicking mm -hmm. around these days? Yeah, someday, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I just, I just, it'll, it'll happen when it happens. Yeah. That kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Do you think watching all those movies made you a better comedian? Um, living life makes you a better comedian. Being present and paying attention mm -hmm. is why you're living every day is what makes you a better comedian. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I want to talk about your new Netflix special, Patton Oswalt. I like everything. I love everything. I love everything. Okay, well, that's even better. <laughs> you know, I love everything. Why be wishy-washy about it, you know? If you love something, declare it. <laughs> Patton Oswalt, I love everything. I love the special, Patton. Thanks, and man. And I've got to hand it to you. You know that you've made it when you can get Netflix to build you a house. <laughs> you actually have a full-scale mid-century modern house as a backdrop for your stand-up special. Yeah. I guess just because you can. No more brick walls for you, huh? <laughs> yeah, I liked it. It was nice. I, I thought it looked really cool. Yeah. And I guess the connection was that you recently bought a new house yourself. Have you been having to do a lot of work on the new house? There's always something, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, when you buy a new house, you have to remodel whether you want to or not because Half the stuff doesn't work. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I love your bit about contractors and subcontractors. You have a joke in there about your wallpaper guy. And 
this is how relatable your comedy is, Patton. I would swear that I know this guy, except for me, it's our plumber. I'll hear him rooting around under the house, but he never says anything to us, yeah. except when we hear him bump his head or slam his thumb and he'll let out a goddamn it or something. <laughs> but then he'll yeah, just exactly. vanish. Exactly. And we never know if he's finished or if he had to go out and get parts or if he's coming back tomorrow. I don't get a text from him saying I had to take off. Nothing. Just total wow. radio silence. It's bizarre. I practically have to chase him down just to pay him. Oh, my God. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. You also talk about your new marriage in this special. I guess when your first wife passed away, you say that you thought that you were just going to quietly resign yourself to being a confirmed old widower and focus all your energies on raising your daughter. But then, apparently, much to your surprise, love came back into your life quite unexpectedly. And I remember when it came out that you were remarrying, I heard some people out there being very judgy and saying it was too soon. And in some cases... These were the same people who were so quick to virtue signal their empathy for you when you were grieving. But the moment that you try to find a little happiness in this world, they just want to criticize you. When you started writing this new special, did you feel any pressure to talk about this in your act and explain how it all happened so quickly? Um, no, I mean, I think a lot of those people were just concerned trolls trying to get attention. So yeah. I just ignored them like I do most <laughs> trolls, just ignore them. It doesn't, it's, and also the internet, the internet, it's just electrons. It doesn't exist. Yeah. It's not real life. And I saw that you got married at the old Jim Henson Studios, which is perfect for an old movie buff like yourself, mm -hmm. because that's the old Charlie Chaplin Studios. Yes. Yeah, that was his, uh, I think he filmed The Gold Rush there or something. Yeah, he, I think a lot of them. I think The Gold Rush, City Lights, The Great Dictator. Uh, it was. I think it was also A&M Records for, I don't know, a few decades, which was, uh, what, Herb Albert and Jerry Moss's outfit. So who knows how many people recorded um, there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was amazing. A lot of, uh, music videos got shot there in the eighties as I understand. Man, if those walls could talk. Yeah. So you recently reached a milestone in your life, the old half century mark. You turned the big five O what's that been like so far? Just great. You know, I, it, it wasn't really, it didn't really feel like anything. It was just, you know, Oh, this is another, I don't feel any different, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, Talk about it in the special that it turned 50 and nothing really happened. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you, you haven't had a, a midlife crisis or did you already get that out of the no. way? No, I just, I mean, I, I do what I, I'm doing, what I want to do in my life. Yeah. So I think that kind of prevents you having a crisis if you're actually doing what you wanted to That's be doing. That's true. You know? And what is, what is midlife yeah. anymore? Uh, it used to be the go exactly. over the hump was 40, but now yeah. everyone's living to like 85, 90, 95. Yeah. I, again, I, I think it shifts all the time. Yeah. You do say that since you turned 50, you've been doing a lot of hiking lately. That and yoga are just the quintessential L.A. exercise, aren't they? And I like it because <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get something out of it other than just being able to work out. It's nice to get out there in the hills and just be with your thoughts, listen to a podcast, bring a friend and socialize. Yeah, but of course you can't do that now because all the trails are shut down because everyone's distancing. I know, although I think they just opened them back up. What's your favorite trail in L.A.? Runyon. Uh, different canyons, you know, Runyon, yeah. yeah. Uh, Griffith Park. Yeah, I love the Griffith Park hike because it's just a great scenic trail and you can always end things with a coffee at the observatory. But I've never actually been to Runyon Canyon. I've lived in L.A. for 25 years and never hiked Runyon. Wow. And of course, this is such an L.A. conversation to have. And I apologize <laughs> to anyone listening from the other 49 states. Yes. But my impression has always been that Runyon is more about the whole scene than it is about the hike. People go there to pick up and star watch and see and be seen. And me, I don't want to see or be seen by anyone when I'm that sweaty. Yeah. I mean, no one's really, but luckily it's LA, so no one's paying attention to each other. So you can just kind of do whatever you want. Yeah. I've never really been worried about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, not to get all political on you, but you've made no secret about your feelings about Donald Trump on Twitter. You are not a fan, and yeah. for good reason, I think. But you also say that you don't do any Trump material on stage anymore. In fact, I love that line that you have in the special, that being a comedian during the Trump presidency is like being the MC in the movie Cabaret. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. If you get my drift. Yeah. But a while back, you did something pretty incredible. There was a Trump supporter who trolled you on Twitter. I don't know what the comment was about Trump, but he just lit into you and said some pretty hateful things. And instead of throwing hate back at him or just ignoring him, 
you actually took the time to look at his Twitter profile and see who this person is. Turned out this guy was, I guess, going through some difficult times and had a GoFundMe campaign to help him pay for some pretty hefty medical bills. You actually made a donation to help him out. That was a really, really decent thing that you did. And you certainly didn't have to do that. Do you hope that that one act of kindness just might have changed that guy's perspective a little and convinced him to dial down the outrage a little bit, maybe even persuaded him to see you and other people with whom he might differ over politics in a little bit of a different light? Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not, it wasn't so much about changing his opinion, which was, it was more about like letting other people see that and um, maybe, uh, you know, it'll help them maybe bring people together. I, I, again, I don't know. It's just, it was, he was so hateful. And then I, when I looked at his, you know, life and saw what the situation was, I'm like, Oh, maybe I'll help this guy out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. He had fallen in pretty hard times. I think he had come out of a coma or something like that. Is that right? Something like that. Or he would had sepsis. I, I, I forget mm-hmm. that was a while ago. Right. Yeah. I, I honestly can't remember. Yeah, it's a shame that it takes such a big gesture like that to convince people to set aside the politics and see each other as human beings again. Sure. Yeah. Before we go, Patton, I read that HBO is doing a series of your late wife, Michelle McNamara's book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, about the hunt for the Golden State mm-hmm. Killer. Are you very involved mm-hmm. in that project? And can you tell us a little about it? Yeah, I'm the exec producer on that. It's already done. It premieres on June 28th. The trailer came out two days ago. And if I have this right, your late wife is actually responsible for coming up with that moniker, the Golden State Killer. Yes. Yeah. I got to hand it to her. That was pretty good. Because before that, I think that they had all of these terrible nicknames for him, like the Visalia Ransacker and the other Night Stalker or something. He had like two different names and none of them really landed. And and in a very dark way, it's like, yeah, the branding, I guess, helps, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hear David Berkowitz is really working on building his brand on Etsy these days. (laughs) Well, I really look forward to the HBO series. What a wonderful way to pay tribute to Michelle and all the hard work that she put into catching this monster. And in the meantime, I really encourage people to check out your new comedy special. It is really, really hilarious. My wife and I just laughed so hard. It's called Patton Oswalt. I love everything. And it's out on Netflix May 19th. Hey, Patton, this was great. Thanks so much for chatting with me. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again to Patton Oswalt for coming on the podcast. Watch Patton Oswalt, I Love Everything, streaming on Netflix beginning May 19th. And follow Patton at PattonOswalt.com or on Twitter at, at Patton Oswalt. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and rate and review us while you're there. Five-star ratings and detailed reviews are one of the best ways for new listeners to discover the show. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at at KickAssNewsPod and recommend us to your friends on your social media. For more fun stuff, visit KickAssNews.com and I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at KickAssNews.com. For now, I'm Ben Mathis and thanks for listening to KickAss News. KickAssNews.